The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Shared Services Link and sponsored by Consider Solutions. Today, we will be looking at a roadmap to rapid returns, optimizing and transforming shared services. My name is Sarah Fain, and I am the head of research at Shared Services Link. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Dan French, the CEO of Consider Solutions, and Steve Rooney, the practice leader at Consider Solutions. You, of course, have a very important role to play in today's webinar as well, and that is to make sure that you get the most out of this hour. Please use this opportunity to ask us your questions. The best way to do so is over on the right-hand side of your screen using the question functionality. We'll be taking questions in about the last five to 10 minutes of the webinar. You'll, of course, want a copy of the slides as well. Uh, everybody who has registered will receive a copy of the slides, and they're also available on our website, www digital. Just a brief look at the agenda for today, I'll be opening up with a little bit of context and we'll have a few poll questions peppered throughout the webinar today to give you a better sense of your peers on the webinar. Uh, Dan will be sharing some really interesting research uh, into the shared services journey so far and some new survey results, as well as the levers to success of shared services, where RPA and I fits in, and the journey towards transformation. Again, we'll have about five to 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So why are we running this webinar today? Um, we think this is a really important topic. Whilst shared services have been evolving for, for decades, um, with the mainstream of RPA and AI at the moment, there's a distinct change in, in the air around finance, processes, technology, and transformation. But what's actually holding shared services back from transforming and evolving? We're finding it's not actually the technology. One of the main barriers is getting all the people, all the stakeholders, all the ecosystem that's connected into the shared services moving in the same direction. Uh, and Dan and his colleagues at Consider Solutions have done some really interesting research into this, and they have uh, some very thought-provoking ideas on what's next for shared services. So with that, I would now like to hand over to uh, Dan French and Steve Rooney from Consider Solutions. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks for your introduction. Appreciate that. So this is, as Sarah says, is about transforming shared services. Um, and um, my name is Dan French, as you probably gathered. Uh, I'm founder and CEO here at Consider Solutions. Uh, I know uh, many of you on this uh, call, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Steve Rooney, who leads um, advisory for Global Processes Shared Services Analytics. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Dan. Good to be here. So um, we're much more attractive in the flesh. These, these photographs don't do us justice, but just so you know. Um, um, so what we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about this research that Sarah alluded to, about looking at shared services leaders, talking to shared services and GBS leaders about the imperatives they are demanded from their stakeholders and the expectations that they themselves have. But we can't really have that conversation without a little bit of look through about the journey so far and the shift to digital, because it's the it's the primary conversation right now. We're going to look a little bit at intelligent automation, which we we need to address, and the whole challenge around data driven decision making, which is really slowing us down right now. And then we're going to talk about a roadmap to how to drive returns in this new world, and then have Q and A. And please ask questions as you go through. Sarah explained that. So, um, let me see. Okay. So um, many of you, many of you uh, know us. Don't worry about that poll. We're coming to that in a minute. Um, we are. Uh, we focus our attention on this idea called world-class finance, and world-class finance and world-class operations focused on driving uh, the best business results we can with a reduced cost of operations, optimizing cash flow, and have better risk management. And on the right-hand side, you see this temple, this pyramid of you know, we, we deliver those kind of, or we engage in those topics through these uh, three pillars, financial control and compliance, broader risk management, and this whole theme on the right, a process optimization and transformation, which is really the topic of today. How do we optimize and transform processes such that shared services and GBS can deliver what it needs to? And all that is on our platform of technology and data. Now, um, we have some interesting ideas. You'll be pleased to know that most of the ideas aren't ours. <laughs> they come from the uh, 
the community and the company we keep. So these are some of the, the global organizations we're working with. And these, we're very proud that these folks stimulate a lot of our thinking. So a lot of these ideas are coming from these folks and others. So um, I need to say no more than that. So before we get started, I'm going to get you, uh, keep you involved throughout with a, a few polls. There'll be three or four polls we go through. So um, this is just about you, so it should be very simple. Do you uh, identify yourself primarily as a shared services or global business services person, primarily as a finance, core finance person, primarily as ITIS, or another business function or a consultant advisor? This should take you two or three seconds. If it takes longer, you probably best not answer it. <laughs> so let's have a quick look. So you know who you're sharing this discussion with. Let's have a look at the results. So, okay, well, it's good. So we're talking to the right audience. So 60% of you identify shared services, GBS, quite a few consultants and finance uh, um, up there secondarily. So, okay, now we, we at least it's good to help us kind of form our opinions as we get your questions and other things. So thanks for that. And all these polls are anonymous, so don't worry. Uh, nobody can know what you say. We're just looking at the statistics. So, um, moving on. interesting let's come back to the role one more time right you do know what role you're in that's it that's what I was looking for <laughs> so the journey so far I'm not going to go into this in great detail we all know this shared services GBS has a a long and fabled journey of the past 30 years. And we know the story, right? I don't need to tell you this. What's important over the past 30 years is our productivity benchmarks have steadily improved, you know, as measured by Hackett Group and others. We know we're constantly getting more efficient. Now, the, the key behind this, what that strength is also a, potentially our Achilles heel, in that there's only so far, in my opinion, and in the work we're doing, that, that we can continue to drive greater efficiency. There's got to be more. There's got to be more to bring to the party than just greater efficiency. We're going to run out of road at some point. But certainly in the past few years, there's been a big focus on some optimization strategies, such as global process ownership, which I know most of you are engaging in in one way or the other. This whole matrix between business process focus and center of expertise focus, what's the right balance? We always flip-flop between the two, and there's a matrix idea. And then integrating multifunction, multi-source, multi-location, GBS model. So that's kind of a story which none of us, which should surprise none of us, but some of us are more mature in that environment, and some are, are kind of earlier on. But you can't really have this conversation. Um, you can't really have the conversation about thinking about the role of digital. Today, the digital transformation agenda is the thing front and center of um, of our discussion around shared services. So there's my little um, icon for digital and digital transformation. But when you talk to your leaders and your executives, they're constantly asked, go and understand what the digital natives are doing. Don't just look at your own business, see what these folks are doing. Now, we could run a whole workshop on this, and we often do, but these are some examples here of people who've really excelled in the digital world. And some of the top you might identify as digital natives, others you might not. But I'm just gonna talk, pick on a couple, because there's a really important lesson here for us all. So Netflix, for example, we all know what Netflix is. And um, for example, I am a, I'm an economic customer of Netflix. They charge me something every month. I don't know how much it is. They never communicate with me, but they seem to take the money happily. And uh, they, they don't focus on me at all. But they do focus on the five consumers in the household. They're very focused on the consumers. So there's a 12-year-old boy and they're very focused at serving up what he wants. And a 16-year-old girl making sure they're focused on serving up what she wants. And a 19-year-old boy serving up what he wants if indeed they provide that on their service. But the, the point is they're absolutely focused on the consumer and they worry a lot less about the economic customer. Now, all of the business schools and all the training we ever had has always told us that the customer is king. And one of the things that's changing with this new world is focusing on the consumer far more than the customer, which is an interesting point. And one other parallel here, looking at Uber and Airbnb, two examples of businesses with zero assets, but massive revenues and high valuations very efficient businesses by all accounts and these companies really are just dating agencies they don't as i say they have no assets but what they're really good at is focusing on the consumer and on convenience for the consumer 
So when, if you go through all of these other examples and you can talk for hours about it, but the real focus is what's going on with the digital natives is focus on the consumer and focus on convenience. Those are the big issues right now. And that's one thing we need to bring in businesses. So what does that mean in, uh, what does that mean in reality for us? So um, we look at an example. So we, we talk about transformation. We talk about transformation a lot. Um, and we use this word rather loosely, in my opinion. And we talk about digital transformation, which is even more confusing. And I want to use this example just to explain that transformation is not primarily about technology. And I think it's a really important thing for us to think about. So this business process here on the left hand side is Escher's impossible waterfall. The water's going uphill. But on the right hand side is this picture and it represents the Uber business process. So we've talked about Uber as one of the, you know, the, 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 um, the real class leaders in uh, digital natives. When Uber open up in a new city, they acquire a service, they acquire service providers. Those are the drivers. So, you know, they do all the stuff that they have to get the drivers on and then they acquire customers. And then usually their first customers are those folks who come in from other cities that have the app. You open up the app, they immediately locate you as a customer. They propose a service to you. Um, they select the service provider. And the, at the moment you're ready to, to decide, the first thing they do is commit the service provider. So that's committing the supplier before they commit the customer. Now that's an unusual sequence of activities in the business process for most of us. So that's kind of interesting. And then within a, a second or so, they then commit and charge a customer, which is us. Now, interestingly enough, that customer is being charged immediately. So their day sales outstanding, their DSO is zero. Now, if you've been lucky enough to work in a business with a DSO of under 30, you're a very happy person and everybody is dancing in the, in the corridors. To have a business with a DSO of zero is unbelievable. Um, added to which, they don't just keep the money, they pay the service provider within seven days of the trip, which whilst the service provider, the driver might only get 75% of the fee, they don't have to do the marketing, they don't have to find the customer, but they get paid in seven days. And they will say that when they work for other taxi firms, it takes them 30 days or 45 days to get paid. So they're happy. What's interesting about this process is it isn't an order to cash process. It isn't a purchase to pay process. It's an integrated business process, but it's really focused at delivering maximum value to the consumer and the customer and maximum value also to the supplier and also driving massive benefits for the organization. So everyone's a winner. Now, I'm not suggesting we all adopt that model because for many businesses, it might not work. What's interesting is the fact that that business process is enabled primarily about the way they've thought through the sequence and far less about the technology, which is less sophisticated than you might think it is. So that is a massively transformative process. And what's transformative about it is the way they've gone about it. So that's my the, the lesson that I have taken from this. And I think we make big mistakes by leaping to the idea that the technology is gonna do the transformation rather than our business model. So hopefully that uh, resonates with you. So that's, that's one theme. The second thing I want to share with you is the results of this uh, research we've been doing with shared services and GBS leaders. This is not kind of multiple choice research. This is um, in a workshop with uh, whiteboards and a clean sheet of paper. And we've been fascinated by where shared services and GBS is going. And so we've asked these leaders, first question is pretty simple. What do your executive stakeholders demand of you? What do they demand of shared services and GBS and you as a leader? And everybody agrees, number one, direct cost reduction. We've got to be cheaper, continually cheaper. And these are the strategies by which they can do uh, cost reduction. And then secondly, it's improving the business unit experience, which is making finance easier or making buy, uh, buying easier. And then you get into these discussions about what, with a centralized set of processes and data, we can enhance risk management, control and compliance, have flawless issue resolution and consistent approach, and preserve the process knowledge that was formerly in the business. And nobody really would argue with that as a set of demanded outcomes. You know, the, the ones at the top are the most key, but it's kind of, there's not much debate in that. But the interesting thing happens when you ask these folks about, okay, that's what's demanded of you. Well, what do you aspire to as a leader of shared services or GBS? What do you know you need to uh, attain? And this is where the discussion gets really interesting. So the big one is consistently, we want to have an enhanced reputation as a value creator, as well as a cost reducer. We talked about the efficiency gains over the past 10, 20, 30 years. The fact is we all know within the scope of shared services itself, there's a limit to continual cost reduction. 
and you know in the end you just you know disappear in a kind of a, a labyrinth so everyone wants to see want to get a reputation as a value creator second thing is we want to be a center of excellence with the expertise to optimize and automate as well as operate and that's kind of interesting because that gets into the you know process optimization automation kind of into the blurring between gbs and uh, it maybe and then the third one's interesting about end-to-end -end business process collaboration. And this starts off always as a discussion around process ownership. And there's usually a bit of an argument about, well, do we really own these end-to-end -end processes? I mean, they start right out at the far end of the business or right out with the consumer. Um, we don't really own the end-to-end -end process, do we? So a fair bit of debate, but we know, you know, we, we know there's a focus around business process ownership as a, a concept. So we kind of agree on, let's just call it business process collaboration, but it's a big desirable outcome. We, we are enabling that. And the fourth one is creating a talent pipeline for the entire business, which to me is an interesting indicator that the other ones are working. So if the headquarters, if the business units and the key functions are looking to hire your best talent at a shared services in GBS, you know you're doing well. That's a, you know, it's a simple indicator and that's good for the business. So that's kind of a very interesting discussion. But then the question is, so given you've got expectations and aspirations, what are the levers you have as a shared services leader to drive towards success? What things can you do, can you optimize to make that happen? Now, these 11 things are not in any sequence. The numbers are there for a reason that will become apparent in a minute. But typically, low-cost sourcing is one of the ideas, whether it's low-cost um, locations or uh, outsourcing. Simplification of standardization, that's a classic shared services agenda. We get into this end-to-end -end process enablement, process ownership, process collaboration thing. That's a, that's a lever. And uh, automation. In fact, number four, what normally comes out first is RPA. RPA is a lever. You know, okay, so RPA is the lever of success. So does that mean that's the primary automation mechanism? You're not dealing with ERP anymore? Well, no, we're going to have ERP for the next 10, 20 years. Okay. So we really mean automation. So there's a bit of discussion and people say, yeah, yeah, we mean automation, of which RPA is a kind of topical point, but ERP, RPA, niche process applications, cloud apps, all those things. And then the discussion gets on to, well, because we've got so many ways of automating, we need to have a really good framework. And one of our levers for success is how good is our framework for determining how to automate a particular process or task? Because when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So we've got a number of different hammers, a number of, a number of different tools in our toolbox. How do we know what's right for what? And that's a big challenge for a lot of organizations. So that's an interesting discussion. We get into talent and skills. We, we get into business partnering. Now, different words are used, but this is the idea of how to engage with the customer of shared services and GBS and their customer, so the customer's customer, the, the internal customer chain, right out till you get to the consumer or the supplier. And then how do we engage with those people? How do we drive interest and value? And a big concern that you know, we're not just a supplier, we're not just doing what the customer asks us, we have to listen but guide because we've got expertise as well. So it's a really fascinating stream along that. And then we get into the whole issue about data. Do we have the insights to help make better decisions, to drive this better collaboration and drive better outcomes? And then talk about staff engagement, executive support, organization structure. So that's kind of the, the key levers, which is plenty to be dealing with. But the interesting piece then is we gave them all, um, I can't remember, four or five, I think it was five, um, uh, stars in which to prioritize these things that are most important to their own organization. They all prioritized. And because a lot of these are related, we after they prioritize them, or they rank them, we kind of uh, group them into related activities to make it easier. And this is what we ended up with. <clears throat> so, um, We ended up with this clustered and prioritized list. And the thing that surprised me, and to be fair, surprised most people, is B, you'd have thought would come out at number one. The automation stream, you'd think would be number one. And in fact, if you show this to people who weren't involved in the debates, they say, why isn't that number one? And everybody during the debates would say, yes, automation is really important, but our experience to date is that we automate the hell out of things. And when we don't understand the end-to-end -end process and the implications upstream, we waste our time and we deliver suboptimal results. So then the critical thing we've got to do is have end-to-end -end process enablement, end-to-end -end process collaboration, process ownership even, 
and business partnering skills to be able to do that and the analytics and data to be able to understand it and communicate about it. And then secondly, we get into the automation piece. Now that is a really big insight for many, and certainly a big insight for me because I was surprised by how, how significant that was. You might also, like me, be a little bit surprised about how low C and D are. And it's probably explained by the fact the organizations involved were quite mature and sophisticated organizations, so they felt pretty much these things were cracked. I don't think they're ever cracked, but you, you get the point. The, the focus very much was on that debate between A and B. So I think that's a, a fascinating um, viewpoint, and um, it's definitely worth sharing and discussing in your own organizations because you get a really healthy debate. Maybe not so healthy, you just get a debate. So, talked about low cost provider to value creator. In your opinion, now this is an important question, it's not what you think yourself. What do you believe that your stakeholders, your customers in your organization feel? about your reputation as shared services or GBS. So it's not what you feel you're doing, it's what is the reputation you believe you hold with your stakeholders and customers. Are you perceived primarily as a low cost provider? Are you perceived as a standard service provider, a center of business expertise, a business value creator, or a transformation enabler? And again, you can be honest because these are anonymous, it's just interesting to see. So hopefully that take a few seconds of thought and uh, hopefully we'll have a look at your results. So. Um, yeah, so give you 10 seconds for that. Let's have a look at what you've got. So it's what you think that your internal customers, your internal stakeholders feel that your shared services GBS reputation is. Okay, let's have a look at the results. Oh, that's a cool, that's interesting. I've not seen one like that before. Okay, it's, right. So quarter of you, low cost provider, that's not surprising. I mean, certainly that's normally high, the highest. Standard service provider a quarter as well, just over a quarter. 12% um, of you, are, you believe your customer see you as a transformation, a transformation enabler. That's great news because that is higher than you would normally get. Um, maybe being a Wednesday, you feel optimistic, but still great. It's still good to see where, you, where everyone sits on that maturity model. Because it's one thing to believe what we believe about our organization, but the other thing is what is our reputation? And uh, it's an interesting point. So yeah, that's kind of fascinating. Okay, thank you for that. So, so that's your reputation now, let us see. So we're talking about process ownership, process collaboration, process enablement. It is generally accepted from these discussions that it is more and more than ever, shared services and GBS leaders are saying, this global process thing, whatever you call it, is one of our core value creating strategies. We've got, a, we've got global processes, we've got operating around the world, we've got a lot of stakeholders and participants in different areas. We've got a complex technology landscape and we've got to continue to drive performance up and up. So by definition, it's not gonna be an easy job, but that's a critical thing. Um, so kind of that is important that we recognize that. And when you look at global processes, if you think about the revenue cycle, the customer to cash, you might look at it as ordered cash, but customer to cash is the real end-to-end -end process from marketing, selling, delivery, cash. In shared services and GBS, often we're doing credit to cash, often we're just doing the cash management, um, the receivables. But there's a big, big process there and a lot of stakeholders. And it's important to understand our role in that and understand the various views of performance and the challenges up and down the process. And equally, on the flip side of that, the source to pay is basically the mirror image of your revenue cycle because someone's customer the cash cycle is somebody else's source to pay. So the source to pay process, again, you see typically shared services is doing the accounts payable um, function on the right, the settlement piece um, in purchase to pay. But we all know it, whether it's a revenue cycle or the uh, purchase to pay cycle or any other cycle, we know 95% of the issues that happen in shared services are not created there. They're caused by issues and ambiguity further up the cycle to the left. Again, this raises the point. This is why we absolutely have to get a grip of global process alignment and collaboration. So, you know, what if we only focus on optimizing and reducing cost in our little piece, we're not really going to optimize the end-to-end -end process. So, you know, that's probably um, well understood by you, but it's kind of interesting to think about that in terms of the global process view and we all know the challenge of global process thinking isn't just that we don't own it all the challenge is that the different executives that run different pieces of that end-to-end -end process whether it's a head of procurement 
again, as a head of finance operations, they've got different performance measures, different perspectives. So the head of procurement might be looking at a relatively small number of very high value vendor relationships, whereas the head of, head of finance operations is looking at a very high number of relatively low value transactions. They're both valid perspectives, but we've got to be able to align them. Again, marketing and sales take a different view of the customer, the cash cycle than um, uh, accounts receivable do. So part of the challenges with global process alignment, ownership, collaboration is how do we align these different, um, different views and how do we get a common sense of perspective across it? So if we accept that global end-to-end -end process is clear to value, then we are in shared services and GVS, we've spent a long time really building efficiency in, in transaction optimization. That's that kind of that path between the hedges. We go up and down that path really well. We deal with exceptions really well. We're up and down it very, very fast. And that's how we're driving our cost efficiencies. But if we want to have a global end-to-end -end process view, we've got to raise ourselves up and look up above and see where the maze is really going and, and is our path most effective for the global, um, you know, the whole maze. Are we doing the right things? Are there better ways of, of integrating the whole maze so we get to the customer outcome better? So that leads to the question about capability and skills. A lot of, a lot of shared services leaders feel perhaps we haven't invested in the skills we need because we need to be able to engage with our customers and our customers' customers. We need to be able to communicate, understand, collaborate, build a shared vision, and ultimately have coordinated execution so we can change processes and, and make them more effective and drive more value. If we can do all of that, who cares who owns it? And my observation is we probably spent too much time worrying about the ownership title rather than worrying about the capability and skills to get there. And frankly, when you've done all of those things and got the coordinated execution, nobody cares who owns it because you're working in a collaborative environment with champions and leaders driving it through. So I think there's some food for thought there about how we think about global process and about the skills we need, which we may not currently have in shared services and GBS. So that's a bit about process, but we can't talk about this without talking a little bit about intelligent automation um, because it's a critical part of our world, right? So we don't need any help, any, um, any reminder how, how much froth there is around this topic. So you know, the investors are all over this, the press is all over it, you know, and here's research, and most of our executives are all over it as well, to be fair. But here's some research that says that organizations that believe how critical investment focus is on certain forms of technology, and whether it's RPA or you know, AI, cognitive or augmented reality, you can see there's some, some big, um, big tranches of orange there. And that's great. Um, and then let's look, you know, let's look at that technology, the new technology, but also we've got our conventional technology. So what do we use? And most of us have built our existing processes on the back of our ERP. So just for the sake of this, just say, and this should be pretty simple, um, just tick which ERP or ERPs you use. Many of you use multiple, so just tick the ones you use. So it's either one tick or two or three. Just tick the one and just see what you use as your ERP backbone to your business processes. So that should only take you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look at the old scoreboard. No surprises that uh, SAP are up there at the top. Um, in large organizations, that's consistent. In the US, if it's US-centric organization, sorry, US-centric audience tend to get a bit more balance between SAP and Oracle, but that's kind of interesting. That's pretty much what you'd expect. Um, yep, yeah. so, and of course, a big percentage of people doing other things. So, okay, thank you for that. So we're talking about intelligent automation. We're moving on. So how do we fill the gaps between what ERP doesn't do? How do we integrate ERP with other things? So how do we integrate our business processes? So um, let's look at RPA. So our first, you know, first foray into intelligent automation is RPA. I'm not going to give a big dissertation on RPA. We do workshops on this as well, but you guys will know all about this. So RPA has had some great experiences and some great successes, big eff efficiency gains for the right tasks. And we know all of these good things. We know that bots don't get bored, tired or lose concentration. I mean, to be fair, no software gets bored, tired or loses concentration. So it's not unique to bots. But, but the fact is, integrating technology gaps in end-to-end -end process is an important thing. It's like stitching up the end-to-end -end process and eliminating frustration, frustrating tasks from valuable people, making a more appealing workplace. It's an important thing. The thing that most organizations who've been through this have learned is a few cautionary tales. 
So a massive productivity increase in a task may not really scale to be significant in the end-to-end -end process. And that's a, certainly a challenge for a lot of organizations. There's a whole bunch of governance, um, governance issues which most organizations don't really hit until they get scale because there needs to be a level of governance and oversight about your bots and your ERP and your other application landscapes because things, these are moving gears, moving parts. Um, and these are smart rules-based automation, it's classic software, but the great comments I like is the um, uh, automation makes bad worse faster, which is the uh, Walmart comment, one of the early adopters, and elimination is the best automation. That's just kind of a summary of what's been found in these things. But everyone's moving on now to say, well, RPA has found some good stuff, what about AI? And this is not, not going to give a dissertation on ER, AI either, but to, suffice to say, machine learning is one of the, the big um, popular topics because this is where we're using the behavior of large bodies of data to guide us into what's normal and what are outliers rather than programmatic rules. So when we look at machine learning, I, I like just to think about this in terms of a concept, it's a slightly different way to how we might think uh, in within shared services and GBS and large organizations. Here's a bunch of researchers that said, let's look at machine learning in the real world uh, for cancer diagnosis. So if you've had the misfortune to have a, a cancer scare, you get a, a blood test and a small drop of blood is put on a slide and is analyzed by an expert pathologist under a high powered microscope and they're looking for cancer cells. It's obviously highly manual intensive and the researchers said, okay, if we were to digitize the images and we've got a massive body of data, we can work out where the unusual stuff is and therefore use automation to identify the cancer cells and massively streamline this and reduce the cycle time. Great idea. So they did this and they built this AI classifier, this machine learning algorithm, found 92.5% of the cases, which is pretty impressive, right, for a bit of automation. However, they realized that human pathologist is better and they were getting 96.6%. So the human expert was better, so what's the point of technology? So we're about to pack up and go home when some smart person pointed out that it turns out that combining the AI, the machine learning with humans is even better, you get 99.5%. And that's because the humans better at identifying the false positives. But the AI, because it doesn't lose interest or attention, is looking at finding all the edge cases which humans might sometimes miss. So this is a really important topic because what this leads us to is rather than just about automation, this idea of humanistic AI is a key perspective. It's about driving effectiveness, which is every bit as value creating as efficiency, which is our primary focus. So if you're interested in this topic, there's a very smart guy called Dr. Tom Gruber. He's our co-founder here. He's got a TED talk. You just search for how AI can enhance our memory, work, and social lives. You get 10 minutes on that. It's a very thought provoking talk. And um, he's the co creator of Siri, um, the, the voice activated personal assistant on the iPhone. And he's, you know, he has guided us a lot into this whole topic about the role of data and the role of humanistic AI in the work that uh, some of the work we've been doing with our clients. So that's kind of, to me, that is a big, big indicator of the difference between. Um, the effectiveness technologies and the, the efficiency technologies. So we spend a lot of time worrying about best execution, transaction automation, RPA, all that stuff. But effectiveness is about best decisions. It's a really important point. So I'd like to just hand over now to Steve Rooney to talk to you a little bit more about what's been happening in, in the work. Uh, we've taken that to the next stage and um, see what we can hear about that. Steve. Great, thank you, Dan. So as process owners and, and shared service leaders, uh, we need to achieve a, a better balance, we think, between efficiency and effectiveness. And effectiveness needs high quality decisions, so best decisions, creating business value, establishing health and sustainability in, in finance, in our finance processes. And those um, high quality decisions need, need good information to hand, so, so data insights, based on the detail of what is, what is actually going on. Um, so that we can identify where there are improvement opportunities and, and where, we, where we can optimise. But getting to that information is, is not easy. Uh, doing the non-value added part of getting the data takes a lot of time, leaving not much time for, for, the, for the value added work. So why, why, why should this be the case? As we can see here, even simple questions may not be easy to answer, just an alternate view on, um, 
um, why some things are more com complex than perhaps they first appear. And if, if we relate that to our world of business process, if I ask you how many vendors do you have, how would, how would you count it? Would it be the number of vendor records you have in your system? What systems? Uh, is it the vendors that you've got purchase orders with, invoices and payments? Do we include the intercompany vendors? So it all gets a bit complex, and, that, and that's just one example. And there is a lot more complexity in, in the detail. So what dimensions from an organization perspective, what criteria, what are the, the data relationships? And then what level of insights um, that, that do we need in the context of what we are looking to, to achieve? Um, so if we look on the right-hand side here, we've all got KPIs and, and metrics, but typically that's not enough to enable the continuous improvement and, and optimization. And if we think of that in terms of in our, in our cars, we have warning lights that, that come on telling us uh, that something's, that something's not quite right, but it's, it's kind of a retrospective view. So something's already happened, which has led to that warning light coming on. So it's an indicator of something that, that's, 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 that's happened previously. And to, to give us the, the, the deeper view, we need to understand what's actually happening within the engine, are, are there the, where the issues are. And we need to know before the light comes on when it may well be too late. Taking the, the, uh, the discussion on KPIs a, a little further, essentially they are in the indicators, a, a bit like those warning lights in, 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 in the car. And, and typically it's giving you a retrospective view. And this is a common theme when we're talking to shared service center uh, delivery leads. As well as that retrospective view, we need to know what is happening now. We need to know if, there, if there's trouble brewing uh, along the way within the process so we can get ahead of the game. We've used the words defects here, but for that you can substitute your preferred terms, so issues, concerns, improvement opportunities. So keeping a constant eye on what is actually happening rather than looking backwards to what's already happened which gives us those, those KPIs. And it may be when we get to the next period of KPI reporting, we've got some reds and ambers when on the prior period they were, they were all green and we didn't have an, an idea that that was going, going to happen. So deeper insights are, are, are needed, but really we want to avoid spending that 80% of, of the time getting the, the data that we need. So we need to avoid the traditional project approach, and the project approach generally, agile or, or otherwise, it's just, it's just too slow. Typically you don't get what you need and priorities change over time and the balance may swing back to transaction execution if we're not careful. So we believe this is not the way to do it. We need to find another way. And our view and the view of the um, shared service leader community that we're working with is, uh, we need to get to a point where we have immediate insights without the hard work. So getting that information in time for us to make meaningful and meaningful decisions and have useful conversations with our, uh, with our stakeholders in the other parts of the process. So we need a ready for use approach with the details, uh, the underlying details already understood and have the ability to have incremental fresh insights as, as we go. So an Uber-like experience, just plug in and, and get the information we need. So that's the, the ideal of where we'd like to be. So we're just gonna share some examples and ideas of, of, of how this can work um, using some um, pragmatic business oriented data analytics and using P2P as, as, as an example. Uh, but it, this applies generically across our business processes. And the common themes are making sure the information we have is, is, is current, having daily updates so we know um, where we are today, what happened yesterday, awareness of the process and the technology built in and having a business oriented view so that we can understand it immediately and, um, and start to think about what action we need to take. 
So first of all, automating the KPIs was a given. This is in, in entry level stuff. So based on working these out based on real data, uh, being continuously updated, and, and, and again, these are the warning lights that, that's uh, indicating what has happened. But more importantly, we need a view of the detailed behavior in, in the engine. The individual vari process variations and defects, what, what do we need to address? And having access to, to the detail and then using that detail to help us drive priorities. So in a sense, we're getting towards the aerial view of the maze, coming back to the Dan slide earlier. So a simple chart, but based on a lot of detail. This is looking at the, the, the different business units within our organization, and based on the, the, the many different types of defects, where do we have most significant issues? Where is there most scope for improvement? So coming from a business unit perspective, also important to come from, in the context of P2P, from, from a vendor perspective helping us to facilitate the communication with the business units and, and our other stakeholders. And as well as that higher level view, having easy access to the specific detail behind the defects. And this is essential to, to, to back up the conversations with the, that are needed. So time and time again, we hear, um, I know things, something's not right, but I don't have the data to, um, don't have the substance to back up the conversations. So we need the higher level views, but we also need the detail. And seeing the patterns within the, 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 within the detail, this particular example is looking at invoices that come in that, that need some kind of rework. Um, seeing if there are particular vendors that um, where we're having to do more changes that, than, than others. Another interesting thing out of our work is we, we've noted that even the different the channels that you may expect to help us improve uh, the whole invoice processing um, activities such as ele electronically received invoice don't always result in an optimization they can actually lead to more work to uh, complete the invoice or to resolve issues that we may encounter with that invoice Looking at other key areas, like how much time does it take us to, to process the invoices across our, our different business units? Identifying again the, the business units that where there's opportunities to improve and understanding from the ones that are do, uh, process, processing these more rapidly. Can we learn something from that so that we can improve those with, with challenges? a business unit level and also across um, our regions and our shared service centers so that we can look at this example and try to understand why Asia Pacific is taking a lot longer than some of the other regions to, to process their invoices. A means to look at duplicate invoices. Now everybody has some way already of, of, of checking this. Um, what we're seeing is that the, the less obvious occurrences are still getting through in, in many companies. These are the edge cases, but they're still getting through in, in fairly significant numbers. Um, so using smart analytics to, to find them when they are created so that action can be taken and we can, we can for example, stop them being paid. A couple of examples here don't obviously look like duplicates, but if you drill down, you see that Yes, the companies are actually at the same address uh, and were actually the same company. And uh, another example where, again, a common example where one, what looks like two different companies, but it's one is a subsidiary of the, of the holding company. So getting invoices uh, either multiple times or being processed such that they are created um, multiple times. And similarly on duplicate payments, looking for those edge cases so that we can we can identify those on ongoing basis. And the source of many of the issues with our transactions, uh, what we're seeing is actually comes from the quality of the master data. And this is one, a, a, a very common problem, but sometimes too big a problem to, to, to tackle. Our vendor records may have come in from different systems when we've migrated, when, when we've uh, implemented a, a new ERP. There's an intention to clean up, never quite gets done. Um, what 
we've found is a very useful approach is to prioritize uh, the addressing of the of issues with vendor master records by looking at the transactions. So for example, looking at the clusters of duplicate vendors, identifying those where there are active invoices and payments, and that tends to be a much smaller number. In this example, there were 24,000, we can see at the top there, potential duplicate clusters, but only 90 of, the, of those uh, clusters had vendor records where they all had invoices and payments. So look at those first, because that tackles the, 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 the biggest risk of uh, problems with, with, the, with the invoices and, and, and payments. And also keep an eye on that on a day-to-day -day basis, so that if there are new duplicates being created, we can identify those immediately and uh, take action and start to look at the root causes of, of why that is still happening. And looking at payment terms, uh, so I, being able to easily see the used payment terms. This example is uh, what payment terms are we using on our purchase orders? Uh, if we have a policy of let's say at least 30 days, then why are we, do we have um, many purchase orders that are, uh, have payment terms of less than 30 days? And keeping easily aware of this, so a proactive, delivered, simple summary of where trouble may be brewing. So in this example, a simple email communication in your inbox on a, a daily or weekly basis, such that we can spend 15 minutes um, or short time each morning to look at what uh, is currently happening and if there are any uh, items that need immediate attention. So I think this slide is uh, it's fairly self-explanatory. Essentially, the, the aggregation of small defects, process variations, can ultimately have a big impact. So just for me to sum up, we share some examples um, of pragmatic use of, of data insights uh, as an input to high quality decision making. Now, view and the consensus uh, of the group we're working with so far is that having that real knowledge of detailed process behavior on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis is a critical factor to enable shared services to add more business value, enable that end-to-end -end process collaboration, and be a focal point for uh, optimization and automation. Thanks, Steve. That's a really insightful tour through uh some humanistic AI and data-driven decision-making examples, so thanks for that. So um, do, as Sarah said at the outset, do ask your questions. We're covering a lot of topics here. Get your questions in now while you think about it. And I've got one more question for you, which is, we talked about uh, global process alignment, leadership, ownership. What are the most significant performance improvement errors, in your opinion, do you think, in your own organization? Is it your capability and skills for this? Needs enhancing? Is it the business engagement across the end to end process? Is it your understanding of business needs? Is it metrics and KPIs or is it detailed process ex execution data? This is just digging a bit further into this whole business partnering, business process alignment and collaboration. Do you um, just want to give that a few seconds thought and give us your response and then I've got some uh, themes to wrap up on. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Your capability and skills for this as shared services or GBS, your business engagement skills, your understanding, understanding of business needs, your ability to have metrics and KPIs that inform it, or your detailed process execution insights that help inform it. Give you five seconds, let's have a look. I appreciate it's a hard question. Business engagement, right. So this is all about business engagement and business partnering. That's right on the money. So that's kind of very interesting. So. If your business, well, you can infer that actually number two affects number one as well, but by far the most of you are focused on the business partnering and business engagement skills. That's uh, that's very, very, that's supportive of a lot of the stuff we're talking about. So thank you for that. Right, you're moving into the last 100 yards now. So, we've got some big, um, big themes I've talked about. And, just see where I am. So I've got some big themes. We've talked about 
some key points here. Um, we've talked about transformation and digital and about not to confuse the two. We've talked about the cost of value focus, which is really kind of fixing people's minds about how, where, how do we drive our reputation, our capability. We've talked about global processes and business partnering, which reflects totally on that last response here. We've talked about intelligent automation, RPA and AI, and what's, what's appropriate for what. We talked about data-driven decision making, which, by the way, is one of the key tools of business partnering and enabling global processes. And that leads us to the, the points about organizational operating model and change management. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's really worth thinking about just in, in that moment before you fall asleep at night. This come back to the point, your executives are often challenged to go and look at the digital natives. Go to Silicon Valley and see what Google, Facebook, and Apple are doing. And a lot of these relatively new businesses are massively successful. They're taking a different approach to their operating model. They call it a platform-based model. Rather than the design, build, operate approach we take, which is fairly traditional, these folks are saying, no, we're looking at the world completely opposite. We're just looking at horizontal tranches to our business. So the customer experience, customer journey, everybody involved in the design, build, and operate, and customer service of that works in one group. So it's completely, by definition, it's highly agile. The second group is business capability, the end-to-end -end process, you know, design, build, and operate all together. So that's everything from working out what we do, how we optimize, how we transform, to actually managing the delivery for the customer and the consumer. And then the third bit is the hardcore IT, again, design, build, and operate. And on the left-hand side, you see this thing called mission control. This is really the idea about a super global process owner. So whilst we've talked throughout this conversation about the fact that global process owners don't really own anything today or don't own the global process, there is an argument that in the future, global process owners, the successful ones, will actually run large chunks of the business. So for an individual stream of uh, business activity, the global process owner owns the design, build, and operate, and the revenue and performance of the end-to-end -end process and have these groups working for them. It's a very interesting idea. It won't work for all businesses, but it's definitely going to be on the topic of conversation. So within shared services and GBS, I do encourage you to think, think about it, at least so you can participate in the conversation. And of course, technology, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before. It's one of my favorites. Um, we all get um, seduced by the inflated expectations of all new things, and uh, we get very excited about them until we actually have to do them. And when we get to do them, we, um, after a bit of time, we realize that life's a bit harder than we thought, and we slip down a trough of disillusionment. And if we've got the determination to continue, because a lot of people give up there, we crawl up the slope of enlightenment, battered and bruised, and eventually get to the plateau of productivity. The interesting thing about this side is we, we can laugh about the inflated expectations, but there is a plateau of productivity with all of these new ideas. We just need to get a sharp, fast line from the start to getting there without all the unpleasantness. It is just worth bearing in mind because when you look at AI, you look at RPA, you look at all of the technologies and ideas, they all go through this peak. The sooner we can chop that off and start having a sensible conversation about the genuine productivity gains, we'll find we'll be on a lot faster route to value. And obviously in technology, there's a lot of lessons that we've heard, and these are some quotes from people I uh, respect. I think Steve Gordon of Beckton Dickinson, his comment there about RPA is about fixing the potholes in the road. Don't confuse it with building a new highway is an important warning to us all. Don't trade the entire toolbox for one screwdriver, which is a, the same way of saying, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But the one I like, which makes me laugh, because I hear it a lot, is one of the myths in AI is you can AI your way out of something you don't understand. So if you hear people talk about a part of your business that nobody understands, but they think you're gonna apply AI to it, tell them to think again. So, the fact of the matter is we're all led to believe and, uh, and, and our executives particularly think there's a silver bullet. It's very easy to hope for an easy fix. Now, what's interesting about these words here written by a Nobel Prize winner who's a surgeon. And so whether it's, you know, global business processes, global business services, shared services or surgery, we've got the same problem, right? That it's about we've got to focus on the aggregation of marginal gains. And if we're going to do that, we have to have the right sort of talent. We've spent our, you know, we've spent a lot of flip-flopping between the desire for generalists who are capable of lots of things, and definitely in, with the shared services in GBS, we've definitely focused a lot of expert, eye-shaped people, very good in the tunnel, very efficient, good at managing specific exceptions. But the future is definitely going to be this T-shaped person, capable of lots of things, a generalist, but an ex expert in at least one of them. So we talked about these strategic aspirations, and we've talked a lot about all of these. Um, it's really important for us to bear that in mind. 
how do we become a value creator as well as a cost reducer? How do we how do we become capable and expert at optimizing and automation as well as operation? How do we really become the leaders in end-to-end -end business process collaboration, even if we don't call it ownership? And how do we become a talent pipeline for the entire business? So if you were to say, what is the roadmap for that? You'd say, bear in mind, transformation isn't something that happens all the time. It's a fundamental business process change. Think about that Uber example. That's what transformation is about, fundamentally changing the nature and order of things. And then most of our time is going to be focusing on optimizing continuous improvement while driving a car at speed. And whether it's transformation or optimization, this global process alignment, collaboration, stewardship is a key. So we want to use that to help plan for uncertainty by getting better understanding about process and data. Embrace this idea of data-driven decision making. Use and develop business partnering skills to really drive this effective stakeholder collaboration because we can't do it without that. Align digital automation with end-to-end -end process goals. Don't do them separately. And always remember, eliminate simplification is the best start point. And we've got to make sure we've got the talent that we deserve to get what we need to get done. So these are the topics we've discussed. Um, I know it's been a fairly intense 50 minutes. I'm sure you got some questions. Sarah, back to you. That's great. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Steve, for a great presentation. Um, we do have time for a few um, questions, but if we don't get to yours, please still submit them to us and Dan and his team can get back to you. Um, so I will read out this uh, first question uh, here, and that's uh, from a listener. Um, and if you follow the, so Dan, I'll put this to you. If you follow the, the, the CPOC approach and build leading indicators on, on the inputs to the process, uh, these indicators uh, become predictive of the process output. With that in mind, the first thing is to understand your process and define some leading indicators around it. And then once the process is stable enough, then you start thinking about the automation. Um, I let me just it gets cut off. Hold on, bear with me. That's a long question. Yeah, there <laughs> we go. Um, well, I think so. What's it? Because that's an assertion. It's not a question. But true. is there an end point of that? Because I think I get what the point is. But do you want me to have a go? I think the character limit came off uh, before I was able to finish it. But do you just want to have a just a just okay. A, 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 so there's a, there's a lesson. If you have a question which exceeds a character limit, then so I do understand this idea of you know, leading indicators of process success and make sure you understand the leading indicators before you automate. I get all that. And really, that's the essence of the data driven decision making. Before we leap into things, we've got to understand the way the process operates. And this, in the way the complexity of our business is today, the sad truth is not many people know how the business processes operate. In fact, the evidence is almost nobody understands in detail, which is why if you get this insight into what's actually going on and then work out what's, what the outcome, you know what the outcomes you're expecting and you know what's going on, you can then also determine what those leading indicators should be. And part of those leading indicators are informed by what actually goes on because you'll find those things that really don't help the outcome and it helps you inform the leading indicators. So I think, I don't know whether that helps your question, but I'm a big believer in in making sure you understand that process first. And it doesn't need to take a lot of time. This approach we've talked about, people get connected and get analysis, understand it straight away. And within a couple of weeks, you're ready to start saying, right, what are we gonna do? So hopefully that helps a bit. But I agree with your idea about understanding, um, if it's like a balanced scorecard, leading indicators and lagging indicators are, uh, are important to separate. Okay, great. Uh, one last question here. Um, if that's okay, um, uh, which is a common way to, to call the, the benefits of an improvement project? Uh, how do you turn, how do you determine what hit your PL? Hard savings, soft savings? Do you have any, any examples? Well, um, process improvement, um, the benefits kind of often depend on whether you, you know, who, where, who the beneficiary is. So if the beneficiary is the end consumer or customer of a business, then you've got a very, very clear you've got a very clear um, business case or, uh, where you're talking about impacting the consumer into the customer, which is either going to impact customer loyalty or revenue, or I guess even margin of delivery. So there's some, when you're dealing with um, processes that touch the external consumer, then it's very clear. Internally, to me, it's about cycle time. It's about value delivered. It's about um, effort eliminated or deferred. Sometimes it's not just taking away effort we put in today, it's effort we know we should put in, but we're not doing it. 
So I think it's, uh, it's eliminating effort, it's creating value, and cycle time is a big, big issue. How we can dramatically collapse the cycle time of getting things done. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we are approaching the hour. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dan and Steve, for your great presentation. Um, if we didn't answer your question, we will submit them to the team at Consider. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we have a number of uh, webinars coming up. Um, and I hear you person who wanted to look at the Atlanta Summit and anyone else, there are some spaces available. So please do reach out to us and we will get back to you. Uh, and a number of webinars, uh, particularly in the tax area, which may be uh, applicable to you or your colleagues. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today. And we'd like to thank you again uh, to Dan, Steve, and everyone on the webinar today. And we look forward to welcoming you next time. Thank you and goodbye.